The typical woman who shows up in my office looking for something to help with hot flashes has already tried a few things on her own. It's estimated that between 50 and 75% of postmenopausal women use complementary and alternative therapies for management of menopausal symptoms based on recommendations they get from a coworker, their manicurist, the latest TikTok menopause influencer, or an ad that pops up on Facebook. It's kind of creepy how Facebook knows that you're having hot flashes and inundates you with remedies, usually at 2 a.m. Pollen extract, soy, maca, estrogen. The options are as endless as the ads. And the testimonials are so convincing, even I sometimes believe them. In today's episode, I'm going to fill you in on which of those over-the-counter botanicals might actually fix your broken thermostat. I'm Dr. Lauren Stryker, a gynecologist, best-selling author, and a nationally recognized menopause expert. When it comes to menopause, midlife, and what comes after, I'm betting you've not gotten a lot of information from your own doctor. If women are given good information, they'll make good choices. And I'm here to give you the inside information. I get it. The idea of using an over-the-counter herb is far more appealing than starting down the prescription road. Why make an appointment, take time off from work, sit in someone's waiting room and get 10 minutes of time from someone who may or may not know anything when it comes to hot flashes, and then walk out the door at the prescription for something you really don't want to take and probably won't be covered by insurance if there's something you can just pick up at the corner store that's not only natural and therefore safe, but will get rid of your flashes. No downside and potentially a very big upside. This is hardly a new phenomenon. Back in the 1870s, Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound was the popular cure-all for virtually every gynecologic ailment, including menopause-related problems. You got to love Lydia Pinkham. Not only was she a supporter of women's rights and publicly and vehemently anti-slavery, but she really wanted to help other women. She was quite the entrepreneur. Lydia recognized and took advantage of an unmet need. Women were suffering and their doctors were not helping them. Sound familiar? She was particularly interested in menstrual and menopausal ailments that women would be too embarrassed to report to their doctors. So she mixed up an herbal concoction and started selling it out of her basement. And no surprise, Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound that claimed to be, quote, a positive cure-all for all those painful complaints and weaknesses so common to our best female population and is particularly adapted to the change of life, was wildly successful. No doubt its 18% alcohol content had something to do with its popularity. Even very proper ladies could remain legitimately inebriated as they dealt with difficult menstrual and menopausal symptoms. Another key ingredient of Mrs. Pinkham's remedy, none other than black cohosh, an extract of dried roots derived from a plant used by native North American Indians and today still one of the most widely used botanical therapies for the treatment of hot flashes. Fast forward. Here we are. There is no end of herbs that are promoted as giving relief for flashes. Unfortunately, most have been shown not to work beyond an initial placebo effect. Very few scientific well-designed studies on herbal treatments for hot flashes have been published. These kinds of studies, extremely expensive and difficult to do because a large number of patients and a long time frame are required. In addition, products used in the treatment of hot flashes are particularly tricky to study. First, the placebo effect is so large. If a trusted source advises taking soy, Chinese herbs, or blue M&Ms, at least 30% of people will experience fewer flashes. The placebo effect is real. It just doesn't last. For about 12 weeks, pretty much any product you believe in will reduce the severity and number of hot flashes and help you sleep, which would be great if flashes only lasted 12 weeks. The other problem with these products is what the label says does not always reflect what's in the bottle. Unlike prescription pharmaceuticals, there's no oversight as to potency or dosage. Just because a product says it's 90% black cohosh doesn't mean it contains 90% black cohosh. Keep in mind that the companies that produce over-the-counter alternatives to estrogen are just as profit-motivated as pharmaceutical companies. A multi-billion dollar industry has evolved to promote natural products to a vulnerable population of women who are suffering and seeking safe, effective options. Although some women 
a lot of women distrust the pharmaceutical industry, which is obligated to test and report all negative findings, the general population seems to have little problem putting its trust in information and promotional ads placed by companies that have no efficacy or safety standards. Just because something is natural doesn't mean it's safe. Just because the health food store clerk seems very knowledgeable doesn't mean she has a clue what works. There are only two criteria that are appropriate when deciding to use an herbal product. Is it safe? And does it work? Too often, no one really knows. These products are neither foods nor drugs, so approval from the Food and Drug Administration is not necessary. And manufacturers are not held responsible for their safety or efficacy. But fueled by aggressive creative marketing and supported by the placebo effect, along with the fact that by nature, perimenopausal hot flashes come and go, Companies can convincingly market their products with testimonials and secret proprietary ingredients that are often the equivalent of oregano. A lucrative industry has evolved, and women spend billions of dollars every year on supplements advertised on the web and recommended by friends or the expert at Whole Foods. The only ones who consistently benefit are the companies and celebrities that sell the products. This episode is the last segment of a three-parter to cover all of the non-hormonal options available to help with hot flashes. Part one, episode 85, was an update of non-hormonal medications that require a prescription. Part two, episode 87, covered lifestyle, things like yoga, mind-body techniques, acupuncture, and cooling devices. Today, I'm going to cover the research and scientific studies that have been done on commonly used over-the-counter botanicals and dietary supplements as a guide to what works and what doesn't work. Before I get started with what's known and not known about the science, or in most cases, the lack of science behind many of these over-the-counter options, if you've been listening to any of my podcasts, at this point, you're well aware that along with other menopause experts, I'm a huge advocate as estrogen as the safest and most effective way to get rid of hot flashes, in addition to having other benefits like bone health and vaginal health. But having said that, there are lots of circumstances in which I recommend non-hormonal products. Currently, women with breast cancer are advised not to take systemic estrogen. Some women are taking estrogen or one of the non-hormonal prescription options covered in episode 85, but are still flashing and want to layer with the second product. Other women, they just don't feel their hot flashes are severe enough or consistent enough to warrant estrogen or another prescription product, but need a little hot flash help. The point is, there are lots of circumstances in which it's reasonable and appropriate to try an over-the-counter botanical. But if you're going to do that, I want you to use something that might actually work instead of wasting not only a lot of money, but also a lot of time on something that's useless. In this episode, I'm going to cover products that are most commonly used and advertised. So if I don't mention something you're curious about, the National Institute of Health has an excellent website and is a good source of information to check out other products and to get additional information about herbal supplements. The link is in the program notes. For each product I talk about, I'm going to assign a category. My categories are not based on my opinion. They're based on the scientific studies that are currently available. Category one are products that in large placebo controlled trials have scientifically been shown to reduce hot flashes beyond the placebo effect. Meaning these are products that I recommend to women who prefer to try an over-the-counter product before they commit to hormone therapy. Category two are products that in large placebo-controlled scientific trials have been shown to not reduce hot flashes beyond the placebo effect or have been shown to be dangerous and shouldn't be used even if they do take away hot flashes. In other words, thumbs down. Category three. Category three goes under the heading of possibly effective, meaning the studies are conflicting. Some studies show they're helpful, others not so much. Some have more studies than others. It's kind of all over the map. These products have conflicting data and may be useful, but more studies are needed. But to be in this category, in a minimum, there's no reason to believe these products are harmful. And finally, category four, which I call who knows. These are products for which there are no scientific studies published and in the Journal of Wishful Thinking. This is the scary category because without testing, there's a possibility that not only is efficacy questionable, but even more important, there's no way to know it's safe. And just because something is natural does not mean it's safe. Arsenic comes to mind. 
If I say it's in category four, who knows? What I'm really saying is I wouldn't take it myself or recommend that a patient try it. So category one is proven to be effective. Category two is proven to not be effective. Category three is it won't harm you and it might help you. And category four is a hard no. In addition to my conclusions based on the scientific data, I'll also let you know what the Menopause Society has to say in their position statement. I explain the details of their position statement and how a product gets rated as recommended or not recommended in episode 85. Whenever I write or talk about this stuff, I assume that I'm going to get some nasty comments on social media like, I can't believe you said wild DM doesn't work. I take wild DM and I haven't had a half flash in a year, often followed by, you're a complete moron. Unfortunately, anecdotal testimonials are not scientifically valid despite companies using them to sell their products. And it's entirely possible that something I put in category two, three, or four may one day be worthy of category one. Unless you have done a prospective placebo-controlled trial with at least 100 women lasting more than 12 weeks, please do not write to tell me that Dung Quay completely relieved your hot flashes. I'm very happy for you and glad you're no longer suffering, but your anecdotal experience is not a reason for me to recommend it. Likewise, I may recommend a product that doesn't work for you. And that's the nature of these products. There's not one product I'm going to discuss that gets rid of hot flashes in 100% of women. Not even estrogen can promise that. So if you're using one of the products on the recommended list and you're still sweating through your clothes and opening freezer doors in the grocery store to get some relief, it's time to see your doctor for a prescription option. In any case, I don't respond to nasty comments on social media, especially nasty comments that attack me as opposed to disagreeing with my information. It's hard to have a civil dialogue with someone that starts by saying you're a moron. But then social media is not about civility. I digress. Back to the topic. Let me start by talking about the general category of phytoestrogens, also known as isoflavins. Phytoestrogens are compounds that occur naturally in many plants, fruits, and vegetables. The chemical structure of phytoestrogens is similar to estradiol, so it's not surprising that they have estrogenic properties and bind to estrogen receptors in animals and human beings. Two types of isoflavones, genistein and daidzein, are found in soybeans, chickpeas, and lentils and are thought to have of the phytoestrogens, the most potent estrogen-like activity, but still at a much, much weaker rate than human estrogen. There are over 15,000 studies on the isoflavones, and no, I did not review them. Instead, I review other people's reviews of the studies after the not very scientific studies have been called out. And it's amazing how when you get rid of the poorly designed studies, 15,000 quickly gets reduced to a much more manageable number. But results are all over the map. There is a huge variability in terms of what's effective, and often the soy is combined with other supplements. Basically, most of these studies are worthless studies. The other problem with most of the soy studies is that they're too short. A study less than 12 weeks is measuring the placebo effect, not the effect of the product. Experts feel that at least, at least 16 weeks is needed for results to be valid. Keep in mind, there's many isoflavones in many forms that are taken in many doses and often together with other herbals. Most studies do not really address safety and efficacy in a useful way. There's a wide range of effectiveness depending on the specific product. In general, phytoestrogens have no serious side effects. Many women turn to phytoestrogens because they're trying to avoid estrogen, either because they have breast cancer or they're under the misconception that estrogen will cause breast cancer. No phytoestrogen has ever been proven to increase the risk of an estrogen-positive breast cancer recurrence or increase the risk of developing breast cancer. But if you're avoiding estrogen for that reason, you probably should avoid phytoestrogens as well. The most effective phytoestrogens are phytoestrogen plants that contain daidzine. Soy is rich in daidzine, that's D-A-I-D-Z-E-I-N, which is why it's commonly recommended. Soy can be eaten as food, but it's also available as a powder in supplement form. And soy in general is good for you. It's been shown to reduce cholesterol, lower heart disease rates, and possibly decrease cancer rates. What will soy do for your hot flashes? The data is inconsistent. In some studies, soy has been shown to decrease the number and severity of hot flashes. In other studies, soy has been shown to have zero effect on the number and severity of hot flashes. But There is a scientific reason why soy helps some women, but not others. It turns out it actually 
isn't the date zine and zoi that's the magic ingredient that can provide hot flash relief. It's the metabolite of date zine. When you ingest soy, date zine is broken down in the intestine to different components. One of the breakdown products of date zine is called S equal, S dash E Q U O L. So date zine doesn't reduce hot flashes. S equal reduces hot flashes. This is the important part. One reason soy study results are mixed is that there's a genetic difference in a woman's ability to metabolize daidzine in soy to S equal. Only women that can genetically break down daidzine to the active metabolite, S equal, are going to get hot flash help. A woman's genetics determines if ingesting soy or a soy supplement that contains daidzine will be effective. Only 35% of North American women are genetically able to break down daidzine to S equal. That means two thirds of North American women are unable to convert daidzine to S equal and will not get hot flash relief even if they swallow a bucket full of soy. The solution to this genetic barrier is to ingest the active metabolite, S equal. A 2019 systemic review and meta-analysis, meaning a huge scientific study that reviewed all the prior scientific studies, found S equal supplementation was superior to placebo for reducing vasomotor symptom, hot flash frequency, in three of five trials. And with this in mind, a product called Equel was developed, E-Q-U-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. So if you're going to go the soy route, there's a much greater likelihood that Equel will work for you than one of the other soy products. In randomized placebo-controlled trials, women taking Equel slept better had an average of five less flashes per day. And this is the important part. It was still working at 16 weeks. It was not a placebo effect. In addition, there's excellent quality control with Equal, so you know what you're getting. Unlike a lot of other soy products, what's on the label reflects what's in the bottle. Each tablet consistently has five milligrams of S equal, not six, not four, five. The same cannot be said for other products. As far as safety considerations, obviously soy is not for you if you have a soy allergy. Rarely women experience stomach upset, constipation, or diarrhea. It's also important to note that soy might alter thyroid function if you're deficient in iodine. The Menopause Society lumped together all the soy products and does not give them a level one recommended rating since there's so much inconsistency and so many poorly designed studies. I totally agree when all the soy products are considered together, which is why I put the soy products in general in my category three, meaning possibly effective. But for me, Equal goes in my category one, shown to be effective. If a woman wants to go with a botanical, I tell them to start with Equal for the best chance of it working. And I've got a link in the program notes for more information on Equal, as well as a discount code. You're welcome. All right, next up are products that contain pollen extracted from flowers. Relazin claims to reduce menopause symptoms because of its antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. It has no estrogenic activity. Only one small randomized controlled study of 53 menopausal women showed significant reductions in vasomotor symptoms and improvements in other quality of life parameters in the pollen extract group, the relazin group. Another small study, which lasted only 12 weeks, reported that hot flashes were reduced by 48.5% and sleep disturbance by 50.1%, which is significant. The manufacturer states there's no pollen in the product, so it's safe for women with pollen allergies. Although this is all very encouraging, the studies are small and short. So I put relazin into category three, possibly effective, worth a try, won't hurt you, but I'd like to see more studies before I get all excited about it. Moving on to amberin, A-M-B-E-R-E-N. The active ingredient in amberin is ammonium succinate. I looked at their website and was really impressed. According to the website, amberin gets rid of hot flashes and helps with sleep, fatigue, mood swings, weight gain, irritability, anxiety, stress. And if that wasn't enough, it will, quote, help regulate your hormone production. It sounds too good to be true, and that's because it isn't true. All of this was based on two clinical studies lasting 90 days that were funded by the manufacturer. NAM slammed it with their level two. Do not recommend. 
I'm giving it a Dr. Stryker level four. Who knows? Did I mention that on their website, there's a small asterisk next to all their claims? And if you scroll to the bottom of the page, and it's a long scroll because of all the enthusiastic testimonials, there's a statement that none of their claims have been evaluated by the FDA, which brings me to Estrovera. When I was growing up, we grew rhubarb in our backyard. Evidently, rhubarb is the go-to for some women to relieve hot flashes. Every summer, my mom regularly baked delicious strawberry rhubarb pies. Since she was taking estrogen, I know it wasn't to relieve her hot flashes. It was because she liked strawberry rhubarb pie. Estrovera contains rhubarb root. Estrovera's website is compelling as Amberin's website. Evidently, Siberian rhubarb root will not only eliminate every single symptom of menopause, including sexual frustration, but it will work as quickly as one week. One week. I'm impressed. Are you impressed? What does the data show? The data is a little sparse. In their clinical trial, 54 women received rhubarb root capsules. Only 39 of them completed the trial. 55 women were given placebo capsules, but only seven of them completed the trial. My conclusion is that their dropout rate would not have been nearly as high if they'd given them strawberry rhubarb pie instead of rhubarb capsules. At 12 weeks, there was a decrease in hot flashes in the group taking the rhubarb capsules. NAMS puts estrovera in the do not recommend category. I put estrovera in the why not just eat a piece of pie category. Hops are next up, as in the same hops that are used to brew beer. The hop plant contains a phytoestrogen, which has mild estrogenic activity. Hop cones have a lovely aroma and are used to add flavors to other grains. This is another one in which evidence is limited and inconsistent. Most research has been done in rats, and though promising, women are not rats. There have been two small human trials using hops to treat symptoms of menopause. Neither showed a positive difference in the hops group compared to the placebo group. Assuming you're not drinking barrels of beer to get your hops, there are no major safety concerns beyond the general ones for all phytoestrogens. On this one, I'm in between possibly effective and who knows. On to omega-3 fatty acids. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm going to say something nice about omega-3 fatty acids. And you're right. I'm going to say something nice. Omega-3 fatty acids contribute to heart health, lowering your triglycerides and lowering your blood pressure. And they might, might decrease hot flashes. This is another supplement with inconsistent results. In one eight-week, yeah, another one that's way too short, 91 women were randomized to take a placebo or an omega-3 supplement. Hot flash frequency and intensity were significantly improved in the omega-3 group. In a 12-week trial, women were randomized to take omega-3s or a placebo and simultaneously do different forms of exercise, such as yoga or aerobic activity. There was no significant differences in hot flashes between the groups. As far as safety, omega-3 supplements, they're safe, unless you count fish breath as a health hazard. There are also reports of upset stomach, diarrhea, and nausea. I give it a category three, possibly effective. NAMS is basically on the same page, not recommended due to limited and inconclusive data. Black cohash. Despite a handful of individual small short-term trials that suggest efficacy, most studies show that black cohosh is no more effective than a placebo. I really wish I could report otherwise, mostly because I love Lydia Pinkham and she really thought she was helping women. But a 2012 review of 16 scientific studies showed no difference between the black cohosh group and the control group as far as hot flash relief. When it comes to safety, there have been 30 credible reports of possible liver toxicity, which is why the label states discontinue use and consult a healthcare practitioner if you have a liver disorder or develop symptoms of liver trouble, such as abdominal pain, dark urine, or jaundice. Reluctantly, I'm putting it in my category two. The science as it currently stands shows it to be ineffective. The Menopause Society agrees, and it's on their not recommended list as well. Sorry, but having said this, for the curious, you can still purchase Lydia Pinkham's compound on Amazon, no alcohol included. Chinese herbs, next up on the list, are scary because you truly do not know what you're getting. And sometimes you're getting something really bad. Something labeled Chinese herbs might be a combination of any number of herbs, but they also sometimes contain non-herbal ingredients. 
I had one patient who had irregular periods and because of her unexplained sky high estrogen levels, I was concerned that she had an estrogen producing ovarian tumor. When I asked her about medications, she reported only that she was taking Chinese herbs to help her sleep. I looked at the bottle, but it was in a language I don't speak. I convinced her to stop taking her herbs and her estrogen dropped to zero within a week. A 2016 review analyzed data from 63 studies and found that Chinese herbal therapy is ineffective for the treatment of menopausal hot flashes. Many Chinese herbs are combinations of multiple herbs, which makes them particularly difficult to study when it comes to efficacy and safety. But here's the scary part. According to the National Institute of Health, some Chinese herbal products have been contaminated with toxic compounds, heavy metals, pesticides, microorganisms, and may have serious side effects. Manufacturing errors in which one herb is mistakenly replaced with another also have resulted in serious complications. Chinese herbs are a major thumbs down. Back to flowers. A popular product called Crila, C-R-I-L-A, contains crinums, members of the amaryllis family. Extracts are said to excrete anti-tumor, immune modulating, analgesic, and antimicrobial properties. Crela will promote uterine health, whatever that means, and defend against hot flashes. Crela is a lot more expensive than most of the other supplements, but good news, you can share the bottle with the man in your life because the same product with a different label claims to maintain prostate health and lead to better bladder emptying. Does Crela work? I don't know. Nobody knows. There are no studies in the scientific literature unless you count a 2005 study published in Vietnam that basically says the men liked it. All reports of efficacy are anecdotal, a firm category four. Dung Kwai is a plant with lovely little white flowers. It's been used in traditional Chinese medicine as the go-to herb for pretty much every gynecologic problem, including, you guessed it, hot flashes. It's been shown to have estrogen-like activities in female rats, but not female humans. In 10 clinical trials, Dung Kwai showed no reduction in the frequency of flashes. Critics of these trials say that the doses were too low and that to be effective, Dung Kwai needs to be mixed with other botanicals. But even if it does work, it doesn't matter. It's dangerous. And unlike most herbals, which are pretty benign, this one scares me. Dung Kwai has been shown to cause rats to have uterine bleeding. I know, humans are not rats, but still. It's potentially carcinogenic and has been shown to cause anticoagulation problems, meaning that the normal mechanisms that people have to clot their blood don't work anymore and they bleed. So even if it did work, which it doesn't, I would not touch it. And the menopause society agrees. Moving on to the next flower, evening primrose oil. Evening primrose is a flowering plant rich in linoleic acid. Oil from evening primrose seeds is used in a variety of soaps and cosmetics. And aside from hot flashes, it's claimed to treat a variety of inflammatory and autoimmune disorders, including irritable bowel syndrome, eczema, and arthritis. There was only one, one randomized trial that compared evening primrose oil to a placebo. Of 35 women, really small group, half received evening primrose oil and half received plain oil. The women who took evening primrose oil all experienced a reduction in their hot flashes, but so did the women in the placebo group. There was zero difference between the two groups. In all fairness, this trial was too small and too short to draw any conclusions, which throws evening primrose oil into category four. Who knows? The menopause society agrees. And since possible side effects include nausea, diarrhea, upset stomach, and headache, use it in your soap, not in your stomach. Maca is interesting. Maca is a root grown exclusively in the Peruvian Andes. It's generally found in powder or liquid form as a supplement, but it's also a food. Some people put it in their smoothies. It's loaded with carbs and relatively high in calories, especially if it's combined with sugar to make it taste better. It's sometimes referred to as Peruvian ginseng. In the laboratory, some estrogenic activity has been demonstrated, but that's not been duplicated in humans. It's said to increase strength and stamina, athletic performance, and male fertility, as well as to serve as an aphrodisiac and to relieve hot flashes. The problem is it's hard to say if it actually works beyond the placebo effect. There are currently four published studies that show a reduction in flashes, but the studies are small and poorly designed. 
Mock is generally considered to be safe. However, if you have thyroid problems, you may want to avoid it because it contains goitrogens, a substance known to interfere with thyroid function. The menopause society are also in agreement on this one. Just not enough data to make a call. This one really needs some decent studies, especially when it comes to the aphrodisiac claims. I personally would really like to know if it will boost libido. We could use some libido boosters. And finally, wild yam. Mexican yams, also known as wild yam root, contain a steroid building block that's estrogen-like activity. This extract is often put in the form of a capsule to swallow or a cream to be applied to the skin. Yams contain a phytoestrogen that can be chemically converted into progesterone, but this is important. Wild yams don't contain progesterone, only the building block for progesterone. And furthermore, the human body cannot change that particular building block into progesterone. It can only be done in a lab. So despite claims that wild yam root will treat all your menopausal symptoms and prevent or treat osteoporosis, there's no scientific evidence that that's the case. A small study published in 2001 included 23 women who applied the cream for three months. Nothing bad happened, but nothing good happened either. Although wild yam cream is often advertised as a natural estrogen or natural progesterone, it's not. So all those yam creams that claim to increase your hormone levels, it's not biologically possible. Ditto. Wild yam cream should not be used to protect the uterine lining when taking estrogen. And if you need any more convincing that wild yam should not be on the give it a try list, many creams that claim to have yam extract don't contain any. Others are infiltrated with undisclosed hormones, including estrogen and progesterone. Before I wrap this up, I want to mention estrovin. Estrovin is the product I'm most frequently asked about. Estrogen combines black cohash with a variety of other products so you can treat your specific symptoms. So estrogen for stress relief combines black cohash, magnolia bark, and green tea. Need a mood boost? Estrovin throws in a little ginkgo biloba. For women who are trying to lose some weight, they push their secret metabolic herbal extract. Sounds very mysterious. You name the symptoms, the estrogen people have a solution. They even have a little quiz on their website to find the right product. You simply check off if you're experiencing irritability, moodiness, memory loss, stress, sleeplessness, loss of energy, or all of the above for them to advise which of their products will help you. Impressive. Which is why I give the estrogen folks an A for marketing and an F for science. So... To summarize all of this, I'm going to keep it simple. When a woman comes to me and says, I want to try a botanical, I tell her to start with equality. It has the most data and makes scientific sense. Under the category of it might work, it might not work, but at a minimum it won't harm you, I include other phytoestrogens, relizin, maca, and the omega-3 fatty acids. Chinese herbs, dung kwai, wild yams all go in the category of do not try this. It's known to be harmful or there's so little known, you really shouldn't put it in your body. Combination products in general should be avoided. More ingredients does not increase the likelihood that it will work. And for those of you who, after listening to this, think I have something against herbs, check out my episode on cannabis. Then Francie took me by the hand. She told me all the things that I can do And why it is that sometimes I feel blue She helped me see the light Now I'm sleeping through the night I follow Francie and me What's this fate is been going through What's a woman supposed to do? Why does the change have so many changes. Chelsea knows the way for taking back your day. Just hashtag follow friends.